Okay, I'm, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. We're going to have a conversation about does the international development community have the right workforce for the future? And um, what prompted me to do this was a couple, was a couple of things. One was um, my, I've written a number of things about uh, the way the developing world is going. And my simplistic view of this is we've got 60 or so countries going the way of South Korea who um, are going to become middle income countries. And the kinds of things that they're interested in or the kinds of the hopes and aspirations attached to becoming a middle income country or an upper middle income country or a wealthy country are related to science, technology, and innovation, greater trade and investment, infrastructure, a deeper partnership on higher education, um, and participating more in the knowledge economy um, is, are sort of various things that are often attractions for, for these societies. And then we're going to be stuck with, maybe this is the term of art, we're going to be stuck with about 30 or 40 fragile and conflict affected states. And these are the states where human trafficking comes from, uh, forced migration, terrorists hide out there, illicit drugs uh, are grown and produced there, um, uh, the uh, illegal wildlife, bad stuff, like you know, trafficking, all sorts of bad things happen in these places and is a major national security challenge for the United States and our, and our allies, and also is a threat to the liberal international order. So if, if you believe that, and I'm going to just test that theory uh, with my friends, then I think there's sort of some questions about what kind of skills we're going to need. For, do we have, what kind of skills are we going to need for the future? Do we have the right skills? What, are there gaps? And what are the kinds of skills we're going to need for the future, whether you agree with my sort of basic thesis or not? So we've got three really kidding. So Patrick Fine is the CEO of FHI 360. He was a foreign, servicer, a foreign service officer at AID. He also had a, uh, served in the Obama administration at the MCC. The FHI 360 is one of the largest social enterprises, if that may be a way to describe it, in the world. And then my really good friend, Larry Cooley, who's the president emeritus of MSI, one of the most respected uh, uh, international development companies. Uh, but also, Larry is a senior statesman in international development, has been active with Sid, the Sid both internationally and Sid Washington for years, a trusted friend to everybody in international development across the spectrum. He's also involved with something called the National Association National of Public Administration, National Academy of Public Administration, NAPA, that I think he's going to talk about. So I wanted to get some smart folks around the table. I think this isn't, there's a lot of other things kind of percolating and, and um, whirling about this topic. Uh, so I think our, our, this is a propitious moment to, to have this conversation. So let me start with some open-ended questions and give you all a chance to kind of, so let me go back to my thesis, which is how I think the, where I think the world is going. And let's see if we can either, you guys can agree with it or not agree with it. But let's start with that in terms of, because I think we need to think a little bit more higher level than what kind of hiring you know, classifications we need. I think that's sort of a couple levels down. I think that's an important question. But I'd, let me start with some first order questions like, where's the developing world going? And so if I said to you, Aaron, I think it's going in sort of two basic directions of you've got countries following a path of the, of, of the uh, middle income country and in essence on the path to what's it called? Self, self reliance. Uh, self -reliance. Um, or, and then we've got a series of, we've got a large pool of, of stubborn, stubbornly complicated, fragile, and conflict-affected states. Do you agree with that? Is that, is that how you see the world? I, I think, um, think, first of all, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for having so me. So glad you're here. Yes, I am too, and, I, and it is true. I didn't fly in just especially for this. I was, I'm hurt. I, um, uh, but I did just land from, um, Thank you. In, from Jakarta. So I apologize. Just this morning. Um, I'm trying to, no. Uh, OK. Okay. So I've had a couple of days and okay. trying to stay caffeinated. But if I get incoherent, poke me or raise no, your no. hand. And say, we have <laughs> caffeine, and we can provide some more. <laughs> um, but I would say, um, yes. You know, the world is maturing and developing, which is a good thing. Yep. We're all in the business of development. Yep. But as we know, at any given moment, even those countries that are stable and on the right journey can have a shock or a crisis. Yep. Um, and so, at, you know, while we know today the number of 
fragile states and or states in conflict or where certain skill sets are necessary, um, even the most stable countries um, can uh, backslide or have, whether it's a natural disaster or um, an insurgency. Um, I, Tunisia. A, but or Indonesia, or um, May 21st, we had the bombings in Surabaya. Um, you know, where we had, you know, the biggest sort of uh, uh, terrorist uh, attack since uh, the Bali bombings in 2004. So, you know, and, and, and the United States had invested for a long time in building up their counterterrorism and countering violent extremism capability in the host country context. And still it wasn't enough. And what we need to do to respond and what the U.S. government community, in particular our development professionals needed to do to then respond and rebuild afterwards. So I, w I agree with you that the world is going in that direction, which is mm. a good thing, but that we can't um, count on it staying on that trajectory. Staying, staying saved. Uh, right? This staying is from The Incredibles. Saved. Why can't the world stay yes, safe? Yes, yes. Right, okay, so I mean, here's, here's, some, here's some threshold simplistic ways I think about it. It's like, okay, what happens if we solve polio, but we didn't have to deal with Ebola? Or right, or right. what if we, um, what if we help get Brazil in a good enough place on the environment, which is where Eddie spends a, whatever money it still spends in Brazil, and we say mission accomplished on that, and instead said, okay, what Brazil really wants from us is a new kind of a higher education partnership. So these are the kinds of things I think about in terms of if the world changes in that way, what are the kinds of skills? that are required for those sorts of, if, 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 you, if we've hired for a certain kind of world or a certain kind of a problem, neither that problem is resolved or new problems emerge, are we gonna, you know, how do we, how do we think about it? And so what you're saying is, yes, Dan, um, it, the world is going in, in a certain way, but it may not be linear. There may be, you know, setbacks, et cetera. That's, that's right. Well, let me, um, when I was in Central Asia, we thought we had solved polio, and then we had a huge polio outbreak in Tajikistan. Right. So, I, and I don't want to say that what we're doing, and we need to keep it that way, what um, has become increasingly clear to me over the years is that we build the right tools and the right skills to be able to tackle problems mm -hmm. in a sustainable and meaningful way. Mm -hmm. But we need to remain resilient, flexible, and be able to pivot and redeploy those skills when necessary. So the um, immediate um, the agility that we need to be able to pull um, our pandemic outbreak experts, mm -hmm. whether it's Ebola, whether it's polio, whether it's um, some other um, a, a health crisis, um, that capability to be able to rapidly um, meet a need or shift when needs on the ground change and building in um, more flexibility and more mobility into our talent that we have as development professionals is something that we need to look at in, okay. a, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Okay, Patrick, so what do you think about my overly simplistic, maybe it's overly simplistic, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's overly simplistic. Um, we also look at the world as um, uh, moving in two directions, growth economies with growing middle classes, reduced poverty, more opportunities, and uh, both a policy and an infrastructure environment, human infrastructure as well as physical infrastructure that really allows the private sector to be the engine of growth. And so you see social enterprises or just enterprises in, in general, um, small scale businesses as well as larger um, enterprises that are fueling growth in those economies. And we see that that does require a certain level of education. It requires really people who've got secondary, post-secondary and tertiary level skills and uh, I think uh, executive uh, function skills. We also see um, a set of countries that are beset by complex crises. We think that that um, is going to persist for the foreseeable future. It's driven not just by political crises, it's also driven by climate change and we think that that's going to become uh, more prevalent in the, in the coming decades. Um, and the, the complex part is that you can have those two phenomena in the same country. Like Colombia. So you can have, because some, you can have part of a country that is uh, growing and prospering and another part that's beset by crisis. And so we, we look at it that uh, 
we do need um, to develop different kinds of skill sets for the 21st century. Um, if you look at the countries that are beset by complex crises, uh, we, <coughs> we're looking at a bridge to stabilization, so it's not just responding to the crisis, but there, you also need development tools or development approaches to, to, to help stabilize those, those situations. And that requires integrated skill sets. And I'll give an example. I was in northern Nigeria last week, and I visited an IDP camp in Maiduguri mm. in Borno State. 37,000 people in that camp. A pretty well-established camp. I mean, it, the conditions were, were decent. Of those 37,000 people, 17,000 were kids. Mm. They had two schools. Two schools for 17,000 kids. Now, if you think about it from an integrated point of view, if you care about gender-based violence, if you care about protection of, of uh, children, if you care about countering violent extremism, and one of the things that came up repeatedly when I talked to Nigerian counterparts, both uh, civil society leaders, business leaders, and government officials, was how to prevent the radicalization of youth. Well, one obvious thing to do would be to get the, the kids in school because you have them in a protected environment. You can have curriculum that reinforces peace building or, or helps to prevent radicalization. And you can build the skills that they're going to need when they get out of those camps. But there's an example of um, where, you could where you need integrated approaches. You need a, a, a development skill set to go into a crisis setting. And um, that's an example where it's not happening yet. So, La thank you, thank you. La Larry, do you, do you agree with my encapsulation of how the developing world is going? And if not, what, how do you see the, the way, if you look out 10 or 15 years, what, what, what's the, how would you describe how the process of sort of the progress or the non-progress in, in, in the developing world? Well, for me, it's sort of a yes but to your proposition in the sense that I think that's a fair characterization of the world. But I don't think it's a sufficient characterization of the kind of skills that are going to be needed to yeah. help in the world. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the, at the world that way, it seems to me that it says a lot about the context in which development is going to happen, but it doesn't tell you enough about the content of what we're going to be doing to finish no. the story. Yeah. So if you play out the other piece, and you say, OK, even to work in those contexts, if you think about what human skills do people need, I think it is predictive. But if you say programmatically or substantively or technically, what does it mean? That's where I think it's incomplete. And you'd have to add, I think, a couple of other things. One thing I think you'd have to add is what happens to be the problem set in that country. I mean, Patrick was characterizing northern Nigeria in a very kind of poignant way. I just came back from South Sudan. Well, it's certainly at least as fragile, maybe, and then some. But the set of problems aren't the same set of problems. They're facing a huge famine, I mean, huge famine. So you say, well, what, what does it take to move into that? It takes the same resilient skills on the part of the individual, but it takes quite a different set of technical skills to deal with a different set of problems. The other piece, and this I think has always been true, but it's a little more true now in the current discussions that are going on about foreign policy and how aid fits with foreign policy, is what our strategy is. Because if our strategy is predicated, for example, in trying to help build up the counterterrorism activity, that's one kind of skill set. If our notion is somehow national resilience in a get the kids in school approach, that's rather a different notion in terms of what we're doing and, and who we're interacting with in trying to do it. So I think the, it is true that that context set of variables are important enough that it probably has, has implications all by itself for the labor force of the future. But if you're asking me if that's enough to predict the, the streams of skills we need, I would say it's not. Okay. So it, what kind of skills are we going to need for the future? So Aaron, so tell me a little bit about, given sort of your, the work experience that you've had, and as you look out, what are the kinds of skills we are going to need? You know, feel free to speculate a little bit. Um, I think, uh, you know, as we look at the complex both security environment and, you know, uh, variances in, in development challenges, um, you, on the horizon, we're going to continue to need um, really strong technical skills.
skill, capability, and expertise. But what's missing and what I think we um, must focus on is continually investing, recruiting, and projecting the type of talent that we'll need given where the world is going and what kind of shocks to the system and crises are hitting. And that is something um, that I don't think any agency, maybe NASA, but all the rest, mm. don't do good strategic workforce planning. And I'm not saying that we can absolutely predict what the future is going to hold and where we are, but having a better um, understanding of what we're going to need, not just today, but tomorrow and in the future. And then having, again, the infrastructure, the architecture that enables us to rapidly um, deploy, retool, retrain, or recruit and onboard the skill set that we need to be able to tackle that challenge in a meaningful way is something that um, at least my agency needs to and is um, paying attention to, but we need to resource it in the right way and make it a priority because all of our vision, whether it's the journey to self-reliance, our crisis response capability, mm. our recovery capability, or our blend um, in any given country that may parts of it be facing crisis and yet we're on a different trajectory there, um, we aren't able to do any of that work without the, you know, the, the right talent in the right place to be able to deliver on that agenda. And um, we haven't caught up to um, uh, the need for agile, transparent, and more rapid and mobile um, skill deployment right. um, to be able to meet, answer that in a meaningful way. We've worked around it. We have a, a You were head of human resources at one point at I was, I wow. was. And one of the- For your sins? For my sins, <laughs> for I got sent sins. to Indonesia and I'm very so. grateful. Um, but, but I'll just say that um, you know, the workarounds now have created their own problem as well. You know, the agency has recognized that and we've come up with solutions that aren't sustainable nor are they a true investment in the talent and the skill set that we need for the future of the agency to really deliver on a 21st century development um, response. Okay. So just walk me through. So let's say I'm a foreign service officer and I retire out. What happens to that slot? Is the slot thought of as, well, we just need to quote unquote replace that person? How does the, what's the, how does the bureaucracy think about it? Or do they say, hmm, we have a, a slot. Do we want to replace it with the same kind of a skill or do we just copy paste? How do you, how does that happen? What's the process by which uh, when somebody retires out? So um, there's two approaches, um, the ideal. Okay. Um, and then, there, then the real. I'm always for the ideal because we're in a think tank, right? We're in the ideal business. So, so right? it takes a long time and this is part of the problem. Yeah. Um, at least for the foreign service and I can yeah. speak to that. Yeah. To recruit and onboard and go through all of the you know security Taking, clearances. Takes a year, and eighteen months, at least. Two years. It depends. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of people here at CSIS who work here. They get into one of these agencies, like the Intel world in particular, mm -hmm. and, and like they're cooling their heels for like eighteen months, at least. And then and recent. And that's sort of, that's checking for like security clearance stuff. Is that mainly what? That and is? everything. And it depends then on the, the vagaries of the funding cycle. So you can initiate the the onboarding or recruitment process, and then have to wait until the next year's budget becomes or, or available. Or Congress says, well, I'm cutting it, or I'm going to have a we're going to have a shutdown, <laughs> and so we can't hire the the you know the new recruits or. There's some funny, right, stuff like that, right? right? So there's funny business with the Congress that can make it difficult. In terms of resource flows, predictable resource flows, be able to, to hire to attrition, yep. which is what you're talking about. Yep. In the meantime, workforce planning, uh, which needs to be done more strategically, both for the here and now and long term, um, is not as robust in our agency as it could and should be. And so our ability to pull off the roles, mm -hmm. whoever's been waiting out there, cooling their heels yeah. for a year, year and a half, two years, whatever it cooling is. Cooling their heels on the think tank like CSIS. Exactly. Right, Are the they still call. relevant? Do I still need an environment officer? Or all of a sudden, do I need an epidemiologist who's going to, to be able to Ebola. help us respond? Exactly. Right? And so the process doesn't support what we need okay. to be able to hire appropriately to attrition. So is it fair to say, so Aaron, were you, when you were hired, um, at the age of 10 uh, <laughs> into the into AID of several the two year, 20 years ago almost 25 okay it's like 20 years ago okay so mm -hmm. uh, you were you had soviet skills you, I you was were a soviet you were technically a sovietologist yes. and you speak russian for you our, did for millennials in the room there once upon a time there was this thing called the soviet union yeah there's and it was bad <laughs> thumbs down soviet union was thumbs down bad so we were the good guys they were the bad guys <coughs> so, and we won so the so Aaron, so do we need any more Sovietologists anymore at AID? 
Well, I will say when the I'm Russians just invaded, when the Russians yeah. invaded Crimea and the Ukrainian Did you get a phone issue, call? No, we all went, we're relevant again. <laughs> um, it, uh, well, they did again, that here at CSIS too. This too. cyclical yeah. um, nature of the world, right? right? What we knew for 20 years all of a sudden shifted again. Um, do we need a Sovietologist today? Probably no. not. No. But do okay. we need folks who do we need folks who um, speak Urdu? Uh, sure. How about Arabic? <laughs> Absolutely. How about Bahasa Indonesian? Don't do subject. How about Farsi? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Do we have enough of those folks? No, we don't. Okay. Why? Um, a, we don't have enough foreign service officers to begin okay. with. Okay. Okay. But haven't we? I thought we over since Natsios and Henry of Four oh. and others, they said, and Colin Powell said, we're going to replace all the boomers retiring, and we filled those slots. So right? back to strategic workforce planning and what we really need, and, and your point about our global deployment and where we need to be with the right skills. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you every bidding cycle, at least for the Foreign Service, I'm mm -hmm. not talking about yeah, headquarters, yeah. I'm talking about yeah, overseas. Yeah. Um, we over 30% of our vacancies remain unfilled. Why? Not because people aren't interested in bidding, but because we don't have the bodies. Okay, so meaning like they're not And then at the we level. do the workarounds, uh, right? And we work do different hiring some, mechanisms. So you'll say, I'm going to hire somebody from the outside to fill that slot? For, for term limited, period. Because five, I, five year foreign service term limit, five year. Can be, or um, a personal services contractor. So if I'm a good PS, if I'm a good personal services contractor, I'm a good foreign service limited appointment, and they're really good, can I make them a, 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 a real foreign service officer like Pinocchio? Can they become like a real kid? Mm, no. Or is that why? Uh, currently, our uh, hiring system does not allow that. Should we you fix can, that? You can go ahead and bid yeah. on any. Yeah, yeah but should we fix that? Career. Yeah, we should. Okay, I rest my case. Thank you. Okay, so, <laughs> so Patrick, do we, what kind of skills are we going to need <clears throat> for this future? Yeah, and what do you think? And you were at the MCC. Yeah, you were at Aid. You were in Africa. You were in, in some complicated places like Afghanistan. And now you have, uh, you are overseeing this very vast social enterprise that has a big international component and some, you're in some very tough places and then you're also here domestically. So yeah. what kind of skills are we going to need? So it's not the future. It, the future is now. Okay. And um, I would, there, there are three categories that we look at. So this is how we're hiring right now. Okay. And, and um, as we bring in new talent into the organization. Um, one, we see that there is, the people applying are very, very impressive. And a, co a comment I often hear from people my age is, thank God I'm not competing <laughs> okay, <laughs> now. Um, I couldn't get hired Because there's such, there's such a good talent pool of, of people. We, uh, we have 5,000 employees, 1,000 in the US, 4,000 around the world. Okay. And we typically get three to seven hundred applications per for, slot for a job that we that we advertise. Um, so there's a lot of demand for the jobs. Here's what we're looking for now, and I think this will hold in the future. One is <clears throat> as talented as people are, we see people struggling with change, and we need people. We want people who can manage change, and by that I mean people who are adaptive, who have, I call it tolerance for ambiguity. That instead Ooh. of being um, freaked out by ambiguity, because that is the normal, that, that they're able to use it to their advantage. I, I wouldn't do well there, Patrick. I'm a real black and white kind well, of a guy. And that's, We're the good guys, the bad right, guys. Right, that's not the world we live oh. in anymore. Um, people who are comfortable and um, excited about the about the idea of lean development, who can use iterative kinds of approaches. That, what is that? What do you mean by that? I mean, um, you try something that doesn't work. You try something else. Okay. Uh, that if you look at a pr you're a problem solver, and so instead of seeing wanting to know what's the business practice, what's the process for doing this thing. You're looking and saying, "What are the six different ways I could solve? I could I could achieve that task, and which is going to be the best one okay. for this particular condition?" So, uh, problem solving, adaptive, tolerant of ambiguity. Um, that's the change management piece, and um, I see in the in both younger people and older people that we 
uh, recruit now, that that's still a big deficit. People have a really hard time with change. And I spend a lot of time as, as CEO uh, sort of proselytizing to the workforce <coughs> that we need to embrace change, not resist it or fear it. Uh, second is technical skills. So technology is transforming our workplace. And it's, it's transforming it not just that you adopt a new set of, of digital tools today and, and you learn those and then you're good. It's that you adapt a new set of digital tools today and then maybe 12 months from now you need another new set like of Like Instagram tools. or Facebook kind of stuff? Uh, like <coughs> enterprise resource planning systems that, that integrate uh, finance, procurement, uh, customer relationship management, made those kinds like of Salesforce, Salesforce, finance. Hey, you get your kickback, man. Uh, no, yeah, procurement. I wish I did know, but we have that in our. We we have to do a whole bunch so, of tracking and stuff on that stuff. So uh, we we um, put in a, a a new enterprise management system two years ago. It was a major change effort in the organization. It was traumatic for many people because. It not only did they have to learn a new interface um, with the system, but it, it changed the business practices. So who did what changed across the organization in a procurement, the actual uh, tasks associated with procuring a consultant, or with writing a scope of work, or with um, uh, charging costs. Those got redistributed in ways that hadn't been done before. So people were saying, well, now I have to do extra work. All right, so that's part of change management. We went through that. We got to the two years later, pretty much everybody in the organization would say, you know, this is better than it used to be. This, this new system, we've got real-time information. The information's more accurate. Mm -hmm. We now, the, the processes aren't as burdensome as we thought when we were learning them. So there's acceptance of that. All right, right now we're starting to say, do we need a new one? Because the one we have, it, it's two years old. We spent a ton of money on it. We taught 5,000 people how to use it. But there are now products that are better. They're more flexible. They're, they're quicker. Um, maybe we need to start, and, and we've start got. Start thinking about that. Uh, that that's the reality that's today. Coming. That, yeah. well, that's coming. Well, I mean, now. that's now. just the reality of how organizations function today, and people have to accept that, or you become obsolete as an organization, right? So you can say, oh, no, we're going to stick with the old one. We don't have to spend money. It, it, there's less stress on everybody. Mm -hmm. But then you become obsolete because you've got competitors that are going to eat your lunch because oh. they've got data, they've got Power BI, they've got ways of doing data visualization, they've got ways of drilling down to a community or a family level that can enable whole new strategies okay. so for solving you don't, human development. So, so you're trying to say if you don't do this, then MSI is going to eat your lunch? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so tech. Uh, so so. Um, then second are just technical skills, fluency with digital, uh, um, digital tools, with data analytics is um, something that we expect everybody to have and I think that increasingly that's just going to be like, a liter like literacy, literacy in the 21st like century. Like technology literacy. Tech Facil literacy. Digital Facility with technology. Digital, yeah, digital, digital literacy. Digital D literacy. D technology adaptability or something, right. some kind of fa fa being facile with. I, let's call it digital literacy. I think that's a good term for it. Thank and you. It, and there's a whole suite of you? tools. We're going to tweet that out, Aaron. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and then finally, uh, and again, I'm talking about what we do now, is we look for language and cultural skills. Okay, that, I was going to ask uh, you and, about and that. And that's not just for our overseas operations, that's for our domestic operations as well. So if we're working in Montana, we need Montanans who've got the language and cultural skills, who have the social capital in their communities, and we do work in Montana. Um, and one of the keys to that to the success of that program was we got people who had the social capital to be able to connect with the, the communities we were working mm. in who had credibility and who were able to, um, to introduce uh, reforms in the education system. That then got in Montana. In Montana, that got widely adopted. So, but that's, 
that applies everywhere and as an international organization. So our U.S. work is about 15% of our total work. 85% is international. What this means, having people with the language and the cultural skills and the social capital in the areas that they work in, so social yes. networks, they can that pick means up the phone. more and more are, we're recruiting from those areas um, or we're recru well, we're recruiting people with those skills, which means more and more our, inter our, our workforce reflects a very international uh, composition. Okay. Larry, Larry what's your, if I said to you, what's the skills we're going to need so, either now or in the future? So I, I, for, let me draw a distinction between the AID direct hire workforce mm -hmm. and the people who are supporting it. Yep. So if you think about the AID system, uh, actually in this case for both, it's grown up now in recent years around this notion of compliance and projects and the, the counter bureaucracy. The sort of counter bureaucracy. And so the, the system, I hate to say this, but a major skill set is the ability to work that system. The FAR, So whether the you're ADS, inside or outside, the, to really understand the, the stuff. understand the aid system. Now, I personally think as there are more and more actors in the development business, like that China. becomes a less and less important skill and in a way I would say good riddance to it because I don't think it really was mo what most people trained for nor what brought them to the development enterprise in the first place. And I'm sorry to interrupt but Larry my first day on the job at AID I sat with you in a cube and you helped me you sat and we together we made some cha proposed changes to the one of those alphabet soup things I was traumatized. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> but, I mean, but, I, yeah. I, I don't mean to belittle it because I think the it's if, you, if you don't do that well, the rest of it's moot. Yes. So it, it's absolutely an important skill set. But if you're asking me to look to the future, look to the future. I would say I think we're looking to a world where the ability to speak USAID is a less important skill than the ability to be really functional and helpful in a complex context where there are lots of actors where the USAID work is very much more congruent or, and fits much more closely with the d diplomacy work, with the private sector development work, and in some cases with the military work. I so, disagree with that. Can well, I disagree let, with yeah, that? You, you can, can disagree, disagree with that. Let me just yeah. finish making but let point. Me finish. So I think in, in this world, the relationship building stuff is going to be very important. The ability to essentially influence change or at least facilitate change in the, as things move forward if I look, for example, at the work we're doing in South Sudan, the effort is to try and bring together the donor community around a resilient strategy for South Sudan. Now, who's USAID? USAID is just one donor, but it's taken the leadership on this issue in a very constructive way and has built a, a consortium, if you want to see it that way, or at least in a, a, in a, a, a sort consortium. of a coalition of the willing. A coalition of the try, willing. To try and do something together. Well, if you say, well, what was the skill set that, that that USAID officer needed? He needed to understand some set of things, but he really needed to work the South Sudan context. He needed to be able to deal with, in this case, his colleagues, both on the government and the CBO side and sorry, within, within the U.S. government. Community-based organizations. Community-based organizations, yeah. sorry. The, to try and build a common sense of purpose, a common way forward on this set of issues. So for me, whether in this case, whether you're talking in these complex situations or in the countries that are doing better. That ability to not, to not recognize, to not act as if you're simply the, the steward of a set of funds to do projects and your, and your job is simply to be able to exercise that role faithfully uh, is going to have to move in a direction where it sees you much more as an effort to try and bring whatever the United States government or you yourself bring to that, to that context that's going help to help to move that forward. Okay. Let, let me I want to hear this. from Patrick and from Aaron, because I suspect both of you want to react to what's so, said. So I agree with, with the spirit of what you say. And certainly we want USAID officers and, and other development professionals to uh, be able to look beyond the, the sort of bureaucratic red tape to the substance of the challenges and to be able to facilitate and be, um, yeah, facilitate the work necessary to solve the challenges. However, there are 72 pages of standard provisions in every USAID contract and grant agreement. And that includes in grant agreements 
from OFDA, from the Office of, of uh, Disaster Assistance. Which is supposed to be using which is supposed to be much, much, authority. Right, which, which is, is supposed to be much just, more flexible. Yeah. As long as those compliance um, requirements are attached to the U.S. government I funding, yeah. then they are going to shape the way people behave and they, they create a risk burden on whoever has that award that cannot be ignored. And here's one of my beefs with local solutions. Sorry, with, what's local solutions? Well, with the idea of transferring the, the um, doing more and more grants and awards. Don't to, hire FHI 360 or MSI. Hire local yokel right. NGO. No, no, hire, hire competent local organizations because yeah. there are plenty of them out there. So I'm a huge advocate for using local talent. Sure. So this isn't about protecting FHI 360's equities, yeah. but what it is is a realization is, is an observation. I don't think USA take, or, or policymakers are looking at, which is you've got. Local organizations that in some countries, Zambia is an example, South Africa is an example, Botswana is an example, Kenya for sure, they have great technical expertise. And USA can work directly with them. But they don't have the ability to develop, the, to, to comply with those 73 pages of standard provisions. And so when in you- In English. And so when you say what we're going to do is we want to shift the funding to these organizations so they can and, and build I'm the capacity. A I'm going to give you a 30% hurdle if you're an aid mission. Well, and you justify it on the basis yeah. of we want to build capacity of local organizations to be able to do the work so we don't have yeah. to fund them anymore, right? Because yeah. then they've got capacity, we've built capacity, we can, we can reduce. So just let me finish this thought. The capacity they lack is not the technical ability to, to, to do the, the HIV work. work. Or Ebola. The capacity they don't have is to comply with, with USAID's requirements. So you build, if, if you're going to work with them, you're going to build that capacity, which is only relevant to US government funding. Right. Okay. And then if, if the end goal is to, is to not be, provide US government funding anymore, then you've just put these organizations in a position of, of spending huge amounts of money on those enterprise planning systems I talked about to build capacity to work with the US government that's not gonna work with them anymore. Okay, so Aaron, I know I wanna give you a chance to respond, but let me just say so. 12, six years ago, I wrote a paper that I was pilloried as being a shill for, the, for you guys, and I love you guys, as being a shill because my argument was a little bit provocatively, and some people didn't like it. I said that we have a defense industrial base and we got a development industrial base, and that's a strategic asset of the United States. Some people in the community didn't like it, I'm sorry, but my view is when, we do, when we're gonna do post cleanup in Syria, I'm not hiring the local, so in addition to all of what you said, I want to I want to have I want to deploy people for some tough stuff. I'm calling you guys. I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick up the phone and figure out who the local yokel and I'm not hiring Acme NGO. I want Team America or some extension of Team America. I'm a policymaker. That's a provocative statement. You don't have to agree with it. But from where I was sitting, I was like, wait a minute. Having this 30, there was a proposal to do 30 percent of our spending doing this. This was the the pressure for mission directors was to spend 30 percent of their stuff on local organizations. I was like, okay, that's great. Then you're gonna have to hire a whole bunch of bodies at AID in addition to everything that's just been said to babysit all those little grants that we're gonna have to be on. I don't wanna get too far afield on the issue of local, local no. whatever, because I think it, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful rabbit hole that I, I, I gotta pay my mortgage and I pay my mortgage on this stuff, but it's, 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 it's a, a two levels down tactically, but I understand why you, you brought us there and, and I, and I followed you down the rabbit hole. It was great, but let's get the hell out of there. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. So Aaron, I want you to react to everything that's been said about sure. skills. Don't react to the local ownership stuff. Don't, don't take the local ownership bait if you I'm try not. to I'm not, and what I'd it, like please. to do is change the conversation and, and um, the reality of, of official development assistance today, if we're talking about the money, um, is irrelevant in the 21st century right. context that I we agree live with in. That. Um, you talked about consortium building and convocation and, and you know alignment of donors and other things. And let's remember that the skill set that we're going to need is dependent upon where a country is in its development trajectory. 
And so if we're in a very, you know, let's take disaster aside for a moment, let's talk sort of peer development. If we're in a country that's emerging and we still have a donor beneficiary relationship, then, you know, Congress will probably appropriate sufficient funds for us to still be a little bit about the money. Maybe it's proof of concept and we're working with other donors to leverage that and help them yeah. grow and advance. We're never going to be what we were decades ago as you know, the solution for everybody and helping them you know, and, and fund them to get there. It's about helping them make the right choices and bringing all of the resources, private sector, domestic resource mobilization, everything else, which is that skill set is important. That convocation, that recognition of the types of interventions that need to be demonstrated that then are, are proven to help those countries in the, the donor okay. beneficiary space. You're, you talked about 60% of the countries that we work in yeah. are far more in the moving into a partnership base, a partner with yeah. the United States to continue to make the right policy and development choices mm -hmm. and mobilizing their resources or private sector or loans. I mean, you know, and this is, we, I don't want to talk yeah. about China, but. Um, no, I, let's talk about China. Okay. <laughs> so I actually but, think, but, you know, we'll but, come back to the China. But just in terms of the skill piece, that recognition of where you are and where a country is in development context and what development expertise at that moment in time needs to be brought to bear to move them to that next level or convene the right resources for the right impact and the right outcomes and continue to sustain that, back to your point about the enduring relationships, is it's not either or. And that skill set, unfortunately, we still pay, we still, and I agree, put a premium on project management and compliance. It's not irrelevant where the US government, for what even whatever little resources we're bringing to bear to have skin in the game or the convocation juice to be able to, to you know, get everybody together, um, there's gonna be compliance associated with it. It's not, as you said, it's not USAID specific. But we need to look beyond that, right? And, and there are other, and you had mentioned military and other partners, yes. you know, yes. the military industrial complex, the development industrial yeah. complex. If it's not about the money, that becomes less of an issue. And we need to look at the skill set that we need to be able to suss out, recognize, and build those enduring relationships. We were talking about time and place being important, yes. length of tour to build that social contract. Social capital. Right, and the social capital that we need and build up those community-based organizations to ultimately do it themselves, not comply, but actually deliver development outcomes. So Aaron, on the that. issue of comp, let me, I just want to press Aaron on a couple things and I want to bring you back both into, so Aaron, so Afghanistan tour, South Sudan, and you say you do a one-year tour, is that too short of a tour? Yes, for a couple reasons. Um, if the person is suitable for that environment, yeah. and we'll we can talk about that We're going to come back to that. Um, one year is not enough. Um, I spent uh, about 15 months um, in Iraq, and I was just hitting my stride. Mm -hmm. Um, and it had got pulled out. And the issue is not just in terms of efficacy and actually advancing our work in that context takes time, um, but it's also the read-in fatigue. When people are rotating in and out constantly, you spend so much of your time not just doing your work, but also getting everybody else up to speed, which is sometimes almost every week, right? You've got different folks that you must yeah partner with that need to be on the same page. And so that continuity of operations and consistency of engagement um, can't be achieved within just a year. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a provocative statement and say that what I've said to presidential candidates and senior policymakers is, to the extent the United States doesn't meet the hopes and aspirations of developing countries, today they can take their business to the Chinese. Mm. And that's different than 10 years ago, that's different than 15 years ago. And so, um, to the extent we're only offering chicken sandwiches and steak because that's what the, the earmark is, or that's what the directive is, and they say, "What I'd like, I'd like a big super highway, please." And I've got, well, I got, I've got chicken sandwiches. Like, no, I'd like an ice cream sandwich <laughs> instead. And we say, "No, I've got chicken sandwiches. We're going to have a problem." So I do think we do have a bigger problem of what we're, what the offer is, or what we're offering that's relevant. And so. You were talking earlier about money, and I agree that money is, 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 is the value of money or the ODA. Use, ODA money, foreign aid money still matters, yeah. but there's a lot of other things that come with the money. It's a vector for other things. It's a vector for knowledge. It's a vector for connectivity. Yeah. It's a vector for, as a catalyst for other stuff. Um, but I, think, I do think that China, as a strategic competitor of the United States, should be and can be a salutary uh, kicker, kickstarter for change 
on the kinds of this kind of a conversation. I think if we want to say we want to have a global development strategy, I think the only reason we're going to have one is because of China. If you said, why has the Trump administration, who when they first came in said, I'm going to zero out OPEC, which was a colossally stupid idea, and then they said, we're just kidding. We're going to put it on triple steroids, which is a two thumbs up yep. great idea. The only reason that happened was, is, oh, I really want to meet SDG goal number six, sub indicator 122. That ain't why they did it. No. They did it because of the Chai Coms. Can I, I, just, I just want to put that word back. We're bringing the word Chai Coms back here at CSIS. Sorry so, about that. Yeah. So um, this is um, immediate and palpable in the context of Indonesia. Yeah. Um, so I can just share with you sort of what we engage with um, the government of Indonesia counterparts on this conversation. Yeah. And it's really, it boils down to, do you want to um, you know, have um, strategic ownership of your future or do you want servitude? Yeah, do you want to be a, do you want to be a lackey to the Chinese? So what I find is, there's, uh, I'm going to think, of, I'm going to use the term, context. I'm big in Pakistan. I love the Pakistanis, the Pakistanis like me. They don't, <laughs> they, um, have a strict special relationship with China, but they still want to be friends with us. And if you, they're not going to say this, but my, the t my take when I talk to them is they don't want to just sign on and be a neo-colonial serf to the Chinese. And I think, one, I think that's part of what our offer is going to be in the future is how do we give folks an alternative to being a neo-colonial serf to the Chinese? I see that in Kazakhstan when I've been in Kazakhstan many times. Kazakhstan's never going to be our best friend. They're sandwiched between China and Russia. They got the whole, most horrible neighborhood in the forget, world. Let's not forget yeah. the rest of the neighborhood with Iran to the Yeah, I love that. West great neighborhood. Great, great neighborhood. So, so they're never going to be our best friend, but they'd like some kind of a strategic hedge, and they just don't want, they don't want a neo-colonial relationship. Same with Africa. I think there are a lot of African countries. I mean, there was an election in Zambia a couple years ago that, sw that t was swung on how much we're, we're okay with China having control of the mines? They killed six miners or right. something like that. So, so I do think China, as a as a future in the fact in the future, is going to have a geostrategic determinative thing for us. It's going to change. It's going to. I think more than whatever think tank papers I'm going to come up with or getting you know getting the advocacy community. I think it's geostrategically what's going to be sort of the what's going to move money and votes and move organizational change over the next. Two, you know, so over the next five to seven years, I think China more than anything else is not going to be, at least in Washington, it's not going to be the SDGs, it's not going to be um, good government, it's going to be geostrategic exigency. And so I think we should take advantage of that window and we should push for certain kinds of public management, good government things that we should be doing that are also aligned with um, the fact that we can we can make the argument for the fact that it's in, it's aligned with that Owen oh, by the way it'll help us do a better job of responding and pushing back against well, China. Let me, let me change the subject yeah. from China to the flow of funds. Yeah. Because one of the things that that we see is that the the, the type of funding of development finance is going to be different in the future than it right. than it's been in the past. It's going to be primarily private sector driven in those growth yep. economies, and it's going to finance. Uh, uh, human development needs through businesses, through, through enterprises and through social enterprises. And so we, as a human development organization, we want to be part of that world. So one of the things we're doing in terms of recruiting talent is we're, we're consciously sourcing talent from, uh, from the business world, from business schools. I want to come back to that. Yeah. So that we understand that world, we build our capacity to operate in that world. Three weeks ago, we launched our own social enterprise facilitator. We did that because we've been recruiting people who have those skill sets. And we've spent a couple of years doing a lot of outreach and networking with, uh, commu with, with the investment community and the finance community. So impact investing, right. and, social and, impact and bonds, blended finance. All of that, but also, all those rewards but that also didn't exist reaching out to ago. Goldman Sachs and to the, to the formal, to Wall Street, to the finance community to understand what are your interests, how do you see the world, where do you see making investments, because we do have a value proposition for you. Yes in these growth markets. So that's... AID does and, and social enterprises like FHI 360 For an does. organization like ours, we don't see that. That's not going to be our only stream of business. 
but we know that we need to develop our capacity and be a player in that world to be relevant in the future. We have other streams of business that, will, that are different from that, a research work and a health research work, and there may be some overlap. One of the important things that, that I see advantages of bringing in this different kind of, of talent than, than the traditional you know, Peace Corps volunteer or person who has um, worked in, you know, had uh, uh, um, semesters abroad in developing countries is that it helps us as an organization reorient the culture of the organization, reorient the mindset in the organization amongst people <laughs> who, who come from tr more traditional backgrounds to see things in new ways. And when we put together task teams, we get these different perspectives. We get uh, you know, the person who, they didn't grow up through Peace Corps, they grew up through IBM. Right. And they bring a different perspective, or they, they, they grew up in the finance, in the investment world. They were a broker. And they see the world in a different way. And it, we're, we're still at an early stage of that, but I see that as a really important part of our building resilience um, and tooling ourselves for the future. So I want to bring Larry into this, but I want to give you a PSA first and give you a lot of props, Larry. So Larry, you and folks like Holly Wise and Kurt Reinsma, with cover from Colin Powell and Andrew Natsio said, the world has changed and the USAID as a government agency needs to work with non-state actors in a different way. We need to work with philanthropy, we need to work with companies, we need to work with diasporas. And so AID initiated something called the Global Development Alliance. And you, Larry, were one of the folks that, that's now a thing, that's part of the, the furniture at AID. And it's now a mainstream part of the conversation. And this, what Patrick is describing, in my mind, is sort of a version 3.0 or version 4.0 of something that you were a part of 15 more plus years ago. Well, thanks for that. The, uh, two weeks ago, the, the SID conference was here in Washington. Some of you may have been there. And, and I moderated a panel on the future of the international development profession. And at one point, I asked the room. I, I learned a couple of things from it. Steve Radlett was one of the panelists. And he uh, quoted a factoid I had not heard before, which is that in, the, in countries that we would generally define as developing countries, if you did the math now, domestic government spending on things we would consider development priorities is two times all the other foreign flows put together. It's six times foreign direct investment. Yeah. It's, and so, it's now the case that foreign aid, official development assistance, is a very, very, very small part of the budget. It's except in complex crises. Except, except in complex crises, exactly. And so I have a couple of friends who are ministers of finance of African countries now. They, the way they describe the role of foreign aid is not, that they don't trivialize it, but it's very different than the way they would have told the story years before and how they use it strategically in their own, in their own context. In that same SID group, I asked a question of the, of the room. There were about maybe 400 people in the room. And I said, how many of you would consider yourselves to be working in something you would call international development from a base here in the Washington area? Almost all the hands go up. And I said, OK, how many people were born in a country other than the United States? 60% of the hands went up. Now, I, it just so happens, I asked exactly that question in exactly that setting 10 years ago. And six hands went up. So between 10 years ago and now, that went from six hands out of 400 to 60% of the hands mm -hmm. out of 400. So the workforce but is diversifying internationally. Tre tremendously. And I'll tell you a couple of, of other ways. One way I, it hasn't yet, but I think it will, and another way I think it already has. So then I asked people, uh, how many of you spend 20% or more of your time working on problems or for clients that we would define as domestic? few hands, maybe a half a dozen hands go up. I'm 100% sure that if I did that 10 years from now, 60% of hands would go up on that. And the reason I'm saying that is I think that for a long time, international development was defined as a skill set. It's a kind of a unique skill set. That's what you were an expert in. You went to school like I did at the Woodrow Wilson School or someplace like that, and you studied that. And at the beginning, if you go way back, uh, older than maybe everybody except me in the room, but if you, if you go all the way back to, to when I started this, I used to use a term, and now it sounds horribly patronizing, but I used to say it felt like being a midwife, 
because you were watching countries and institutions be born. And mostly they didn't need you, but if, you, if they did, you were one other set of hands that might help out. Then it went to feeling like you were sort of a grown-up Peace Corps volunteer doing this. Neither of those is needed in most of these countries anymore. It's not. The U.S. still has a role in their That's major one of the problems reasons I to, wanted to, do this. to solve. You know, so if you, if you move this ahead and say, well, what do, what do we bring now? Whoever the we is. It's a, I'm with Patrick. It's a much wider array of we's. In the I'm on the board of a foundation now. They definitely think they're doing international development. They, and, but they didn't go the same route to, to get there. And okay. they don't behave in the same way now. Right, so. so I think that's why I asked before whether if we're talking about the USAID employees or the rest of the people who are involved in, in the enterprise, the I think it's not quite the same answer. But even for the USAID employees, it's definitely changed by virtue of the fact that the both the, the context in the countries, I mean, I, just one more point I want to make. The other thing that I guess everybody here knows, but I feel obliged to say because it's so important, is the talent pool in the countries is so different. So different. So different. What I say, just to, I, I say this is not your grandparents, no offense, Larry, this isn't your grandparents' <laughs> developing world. It's richer, freer, more capable, with a lot more agency and a lot more capacity and then my corollary is, and if we don't meet their hopes and aspirations, they'll take their business to well, the Chinese. Well, that's right. And, 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 and I think Patrick's uh, kind of postscript on that is right, which is definitely these struggling countries are a special situation in this regard. But ev even there, if I compare that now to that 10 years ago, it's a significant difference. Okay, let me, I want to bring Aaron and Patrick into this, but I need to make one editorial comment. And I've had this conversation with you, Patrick, in another context. There, so I'm in the business, I pay my mortgage, I'm a big believer in ODA, I'm a big believer in development, but I think there's a conceit and there's sort of a sin of omission in the international development business. And, or, and it's sort of a, it's a mistake in terms of how our theory of change. So we go up to Capitol Hill and say, give me this money for health, give me this money for basic ed. And it's sort of sold as this is the only money, this is the only money that's gonna go to health and this is the only money that's going to go to basic ed. And we, the United States, we AID, that $1 billion is going to pay for all of it in a country. Or this, is, this isn't fair, but this is sort of, there's an assumption built in that 20 or 30 years ago, it was a much bigger part of the budget in many developing countries. In fragile states, it still is. But even in places like Afghanistan, you're seeing, there's, there's a whole conversation, if trouble sleeping at night, there's a whole conversation called domestic resource mobilization. We've written a whole series of, you know, bar, you know uh, pot boilers on the topic of taxes and development. You know, we've got an anime version coming out, I'm just kidding. But we've written a whole bunch of this stuff. There's been a, f a five times increase in taxes collected in Africa in the last 15 years. Now, and so if you look at countries like Rwanda, I don't have it all because because I've had people push me on this and I do want to work on this. But if you look at like what are kind because over 30 years because of education for all in the mid 80s, people were told to eat their basic education vegetables. And so real countries have said, I want to be a real country. I'm going to spend more of my tax dollars on basic ed and you're seeing creeping up a percentage of GMP spent by their own countries. And so as a percentage of the pie of what's being spent on basic ed, we're much, much smaller. This is your point. Or if you look at health, if you say, okay, well, give me, we, give me the $6 billion that we spend on pet parts. Very important, don't get me wrong. However, if you look at the total <laughs> spend on health, on <coughs> HIV AIDS, and you look at what the governments in these countries are, they're saying, eat your basic health, eat your global health vegetables, and they've all said, yeah, I'm signing on for that. So the, the power of the SDGs, there may be 10 members of Congress that know what the sustainable development goals are. <coughs> they may be all Democrats, and there are a couple of mayors. It's the mayor of Berkeley and the mayor of Cambridge, Massachusetts, who are into this stuff. But in the developing world, it's a, it's a lens by which people are organizing and framing problems. And so you've seen a creeping up, and so people said, yes, I'm gonna spend more, I'm gonna spend less money, you know, they're still spending money on Swiss bank accounts, or they're spending money on, you know, helicopters, et cetera, but they're spending a lot more on the stuff that we used to spend. So my point is that our theory of change here in the business, partially because of what we have to do to sell to get the money, but partially because there's a little bit of a, of a missionary complex within the business, is that, this money alone is what's going to change it. And I'm riffing a little bit off of what Larry said, a little bit of what Aaron says. That, so the money 
isn't the key thing. It's also about connectivity. It's about using, so money, and so this has been enshrined in the biz. You know, there's like three sets of tablets, like the Ten Commandments in the business of the United Nations. They're the Addis Ababa Financing for Development stuff. There's the SDGs and there's the Paris Accra Busan Global Partnership. But in the Addis stuff, they said ODA is a catalyst. That's UN speak for it ain't the only game. It's not the biggest game in town anymore. But the mindset is it still is, it's the ta tail wagging the dog. It's still important, but it's different. And so I think that means how we do this stuff matter is going to change. And how we have skills to do this stuff is going to change. That's a long answer. But Aaron, you, you're, not, you're not buying that? I, uh... Which part? You know. All of it. <laughs> you say I agree with all of it. I lost you a little bit. Um, I think what you were saying is it isn't about you're agreeing with us that it's not about the money. I'm agreeing. Yes, that was my long-winded way okay. of saying Just it's not clear. about the money. So what was missing from um, what I do agree with yeah. is the fact that even when and so let me um, most recently time in Indonesia, the government of Indonesia spends 20% of its national budget on education, yet their educational outcomes are still relatively poor because it's the quality of education and how they are teaching their yep. kids. Yep. And so that's where development expertise and the right skill set at the right time. So it's time not delivering the education, it's no, helping it's them advising, tweak it. advising, shape, and spend their money more smartly adopt the right policies okay, so and do the right ago, thing. Okay, so 30 years ago, that's but Aaron, 30 years ago it was different. It was, I'm gonna deliver the basic Right, and, that's, and I agree with so, you, yep. that model has changed. Okay. Um, it, for the most part, particularly where countries are buying into it and are spending the majority of their resources on their own development challenges. Our job, I don't, whether you're a USAID direct hire or you know part of the agency or working in partnership with the agency, um, or locally on the host country environment is to maintain your edge on the development expertise to maintain consist you know and remain consistent being the partner of choice versus other competitors yep. to help those countries consistently evolve and make those policy and choices that will support sustain proper development outcomes. I want the companies, I want the universities, I want the scientists, right. I want the policymakers, I want the first phone call to be the United States of America or right. the OECD countries, not China. Right, and, but to the point where, back to the skill set, where we need to maintain our relevance so that we are the partner of choice and are the first ones mm -hmm. that are called, is where that expertise factor and that constant inve in, um, investment in our expertise is so critical. Um, so that our voice. Are we doing that's that now? And that's, yeah. what, and that's what's not happening. Exactly. That's so we're not. That's not happening now. We, so. Well, wait. When you say that's not that's not happening, where investing enough in, in, the, in the AID US government? Yes, the yeah, U.S. government's not because, set up to reinvest in its own people. Yeah. Into, all right. That's, is the U.S. government investing enough? It's happening at FHI. And that's great. <laughs> okay. I'm sure it's happening that's at great. MSI. I'm sure it's happening at MSI. Happening at MSI but, but let me ask: is, is this happening enough? Are we having enough? Are our foreign? Are our USA direct hires or other aid agencies? Just yeah, are we are we USAID? Are we investing enough in that kind of capacity? No, we no. aren't investing enough in developing the talent that we have today. Workforce planning to be able to recruit on board and equip the talent of okay. tomorrow, and we have to do that to to maintain our aid stay relevant and ensure that the U.S. government okay. in the development space remains a partner of choice. Okay, I need to yes. spend five minutes on fragile and conflict affected states. So my flippant view of this has been, well, you know, what we need is to hire, um, we need to hire ex-military folks and give them one year of development charm school. That's been sort of my flippant view of like what we need. We need a cadre of folks, 300, 400, 500, 700 folks, who will live in these awful places for really long periods of time and do long tours of duty, and we need, and they need to learn super useless languages, except in these contexts that you know that aren't French or Spanish, right? And you know, I think you know what I'm trying to say because I don't think we have enough. We call them strategic languages, but that basically we need a whole series of people who are comfortable not only with all the stuff we've talked about, but where there's like shooting or kind of shooting or noises at night of exploding stuff. Uh, working with the military and, and a whole separate lingo on that. I was also comfortable with the, the, the three Ds in terms of just being able to work with the State Department um, and, it, and, it's, and it's quirky stuff because that's a whole different ball of whack. We talked about th the 3Ds for at least 15 years. So can I ask you, you don't have to agree with what I've just said, but I'd like each of you to respond to the issue of fragile states 
and the, the specific skills we're going to need. So my view is we're going to be stuck with these countries for the next 40 or 50 years, and a lot of where we're going to spend most of our ODA money is not going to be the Brazils of the world. It's not going to be the, even the other countries one or two steps down. It's going to be these tough, complicated, intractable places. And that's where I think, the, certainly in this environment, where the political will is to spend more money, it's not going to be to get, like I said, SDG number six, one, number sub-indicator 122 in some upper middle income country because it's the right thing to do. It's going to be, I don't want another 40,000 kids crossing my border, so what do I need to do to, to make that stop? So can I ask you to respond to to that, so fragility, conflict of interest, and the skill sets. Erin, let me start with you. I would say, rather than say we need ex-military types, let's drill down on the skills that we need for those okay. environments, wherever they may come from. Okay. Um, you know, you need to look at somebody who's resilient and where we have our duty of care mm -hmm. system in place to be able to test for suitability mm -hmm. of longer deployment in that kind of environment and manage their expectations. Can and make we sure build that resiliency? Equipped. Is uh, it possible to build resiliency for folks to sort of say I think they can get to a better place in dealing with some of these ambiguous I think we could places? recognize resiliency. I think we can hopefully get to the stage where we can recruit for resilient, um, mm -hmm. more adaptive type of um, officer. Um, but it really is incumbent upon the institution to manage expectations. So more it's, so it's like, no, you're not going to go to Brazil, you're going to Afghanistan. Right, or, or uh, if you are disappointed that your reward for serving multiple years in, in Afghanistan is, is South Nigeria, Sudan. Nigeria, right. um, then you've joined the wrong foreign service. You're on the wrong foreign service, right. right. Okay, because I was hoping to go to Paris and be the OECD rep. Right. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think your answer or your statement is, is flippant and that it needs to be modified okay. a little. Uh, when I served in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, I worked very closely with the military and uh, both with the, the officers and, and enlisted men who were on forward operating bases as well as the civil specialists. They're a learning organization mm -hmm. and I saw, I saw them uh, individuals very quickly picking up mindsets um, and perspectives that made them effective development actors. Is the I, military? Military guys. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time, cause this was 14 years ago. Well, they invested years in training, though, Patrick. At the time, well, they weren't trained in development stuff, and they, they were naive to it, but they were quick learners. Right. Ma many of them yeah. were quick learners. And I made a statement at a conference once that I thought that the, for these crisis um, settings that, that the military was kind of going to be like the Peace Corps. It was going to produce a cadre of really effective um, people who could work in, in complex crisis yes. settings in an effective way because they were quick learners, yeah. they cared about it, there were people okay. who were passionate about it. So you're agreeing with me. So you're agreeing I'm with my partly, flippant statement. I'm agreeing partly with you. Okay. Because it's now, FHI 360, we work in Yemen. We have a team in Yemen right yeah. now. We have, uh, we, we work um, in Northeast Nigeria, we're in South Sudan, mm. we're in Afghanistan, we're in Iraq. Um, we do look to the military as possible source of, source of recruitment, but we also are very careful because you can get guys who, and, and women, who are, um, they're too gung-ho. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, they can go <laughs> Colonel Kurtz. They don't, they don't know how to uh, manage risk, or they don't properly manage risk. So I'm agreeing with Aaron. You need to look at what's the skill set we need, what's the, the experience base that somebody has. Certainly the military is one of the places that, that is a source yes. for that. And there are some fantastic people, but I wouldn't make it a blanket statement. Yes. And, and if you look at the humanitarian community, the non-military, the humanitarians, um, they're also, there's a big pool, a of, pool of experienced, talent. capable people who can get in and get things done. So we draw from both. Larry. I, have a, I guess you cut a little bit different twist on this. The, uh, I think if the aspiration, the thing that we're trying to do in those countries is to deliver goods and services, then I don't have a different view at all. Then I agree with exactly what what's being said. 
But if you ask, why are those places fragile? And you see the task of the people we're sending there as being to somehow do something about whatever those drivers of mm. fragility are, then I've got a fairly substantial difference of opinion. Because I, the, <coughs> the thing I like best about the military is also the thing that I think is most compromising on this, which is it really abhors a vacuum. And so as soon as they see something that isn't being done, the instinct is to do it, to step into the breach. And the, if you see the, the deficiency as being either a uh, kind of a breakdown in, in social capital in the country or an underfunctioning of institutions, and the idea is to really build them and increasingly trust them and lean on them, to keep stress testing them as you go, but to have that, the notion being that we're trying to to help earn a way out of this problem, mm -hmm. not just deal with it in the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. I've had very mixed experience, and I would yeah. say on balance, less than good experience trying to use ex-military people yeah. to do that. So it depends for me on, on what problem you're responding to. In that sense, I'm totally agreeing with, okay. with Aaron and, and, and Patrick on this. If you're trying to get food into a crisis situation, if you're trying to set up an emergency school, right. if you're trying to do something that's really a direct response to the immediate prov provoking circumstance, then I think it's yes. right. You need people who are, where, where context dominates, where they are not scared by the circumstance, and where the idea of a deployment, a longer deployment, is an acceptable notion. But if the notion is that we're somehow trying to attack the, the underlying sources mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. fragility, I take a different view. Aaron. I, I, um, I'm really glad you brought that up, Larry, because um, so when I was in Iraq and out at a PRT, all of the, the provincial reconstruction teams were headed by a State Department, se very senior State Department Foreign Service officer. You had the um, battalion or brigade commander, the military, and then um, the USAID, the development professional, the three Ds in action, yeah. in a very forward operating kinetic yep. environment. And so we were in, we, we, um, I went from Baghdad into Mosul uh, to uh, work on something. And the uh, State Department colleague sat down and we were having sort of our planning meeting for the day. And he, so it's coming from state, so all full disclaimer, that was the source. And he was talking about the different, the, 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 cult, the approach, the different approaches and sort of the institutional culture of the three Ds. Okay. And he said, state, we see a problem at state and we'll look at it, we'll analyze it, we'll write a couple cables about it, I was about to use we'll go have tea with the local community leaders, and we'll still, we'll really exam, oh, and over examine and, and, you know, and, and basically not do anything. DOD sees the same exact problem, they'll go in and then they'll tackle they'll it, blow it up. without any <laughs> consideration of collateral damage consequences or if that was the right solution yeah. in that moment in time. And he said to AID, and this was, ten, this was over 10 years ago, mm. and he said to me as the USAID representative in the room, he said, whereas AID, you're the perfect bridge between diplomacy and defense because you see the problem, you analyze it a bit, take into account the considerations of whatever action and choice you're doing, and then you're gonna do something. You're doers and you're the, the, the best bridge between you know, whether it's policy and diplomatic approaches versus defense and bringing the hammer down. And I think that- We're still gonna need this in the next- We're gonna year. need that. We're still but, gonna need that. And that, so back to skills and development expertise, that bridge and that ability to recognize, solve, whether it's in emerging economies, crisis mm -hmm. moment, or a stable country that is hit by a shock that we need mm -hmm. to respond to, that expertise has to be preserved, championed, and skilled up, and projected not just for today, for the future. It's not gonna become irrelevant whether ODA or domestic resource mobilization or local organizations or other partners or compliance become you know, the, the top priority in that context. Development expertise evolves, and it needs to evolve with the 21st century development challenges that we okay. face and our agency and all of the development community need to pay okay. attention and keep that up. Okay, so I want to I'm going to ask you guys to I'm think done. about this question <laughs> and not answer it now because I want to call on some folks, but if you had a magic wand and you could kind of make one fix to kind of prepare for this future, I want you to think about what would you say if you were in front of a congressional committee or you were in front of the head of AID, what would be the one you don't have to answer this now, I want you to think about this. So I want to call on folks and so so I've got a specific way I call on folks. I want to hear your name and your organization, and you have less than 30 seconds. If you take more than 30 seconds, you're being uninclusive. And you don't want to be uninclusive because be, inclusiveness is a really important value. So we're going to, value inc we're going to model inclusivity. So if you, if you take, get on the soapbox and speak for more than 30 seconds, you're stealing from your other 
colleagues. So that's my healthy warning to you, and then I'll cut you off. So raise your hands, and I'll, I want to hear from some folks. So I'm from Romina Bandura, my friend in the back there. And anybody else? OK. OK, and I want to hear from that woman in the back. So yeah, you. So there's three. <laughs> We're going to bunch them together World Bank style. So name, organization, and very short question. Remember, we're inclusive here. Yep. Romina Bandura, CSIS. Uh, to the question on fragility and going into a difficult situation, shouldn't there be more joint training, like USAID, military, and State Department, in, when we go into those places? OK. OK. My friend over here. Uh, Nick Klesis, uh, former USAID. Um, Hi, Nick. <laughs> Hey, Dan. Good to see you. Uh, OK, uh, joint strategic framework, state USAID calls for promoting US job creation, opening up trade opportunities in developing countries. Is this compatible with USAID? Many of my former colleagues felt like they had a philanthropic uh, rationale behind what they did, not something that um, could benefit okay. us on this OK, side. pass the microphone to your, your neighbor. My question is about state med, OK? I know that a lot of development money is spent on health issues. And we have a lot of people with disabilities that are part of the development and, and that we spend money on. However, we either need a U.S. aid ID or any development organization has a technical skill on the ground, on the ground to do the development. Okay. Okay. I got it. So what, what can he do to be more inclusive? Thank and I'm you. Sorry well, thank you so long. Okay, thanks Sorry. for modeling inclusivity and keeping it under 30 seconds. Thank you. Okay, so, so you got some questions here. Let's just go down the panel and have each of you respond to any of any and all of those. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, I'll take the thank you first yep. two. Um, absolutely, uh, joint training is important. Really important. Um, when you train together, you are more effective together, um, and you you break down barriers. And so, I absolutely support that. In fact, under USAID's transformation. Um, um, goals, um, one of the outcomes is a stronger and, and tighter coordination between particularly um, USAID and the military. Um, but I would say not just training, planning, right? So we look at resources that we bring to bear and skills, respective skills, that we don't necessarily need to acquire ourselves but can leverage from each other is also an opportunity that we want to pursue. Okay, and the second one. So the American, the America First or sort of prosperity security agenda and its, its compatibility or incompatibility with development, um, I would say it is absolutely compatible. If we don't drill down on what we do overseas, creating direct linkage to today creating US jobs, but if we open up trade opportunities, um, enhance economic growth and stability and prosperity in the countries that we are working with, which is our goal, yep. that ultimately provides for greater, whether it's inputs to the supply chain, trade uh, partnerships, and or um, economic uh, opportunities between the two countries right. down the road. So, so let me just back Aaron up just on that and say that uh, I think that it's in our self-interest. America first does not mean America alone, as President Trump has said. Uh, and so to the extent that we, you know, 19 of our, 20 of our largest trading partners are former foreign aid recipients, and 95% of our trading clients are outside of the United States. So absolutely there is a self, we are in the enlightened self-interest business when we're in foreign assistance. We've always been in the enlightened self-interest business going back to the Marshall Plan. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay. That's it. Patrick. All right. On the mission of USAID, I think it's an uh, issue that we're going to in the development community continue to confront. Uh, I don't think it was ever a philanthropic uh, enterprise. I agree with Dan. It's always been um, enlightened self-interest. It, it's always been to uh, to advance U.S. national interests, but understanding U.S. national interests as being in alignment with a more prosperous, more stable world, mm. where things like extreme poverty uh, hurt us all. 
<clears throat> and are a threat to our national interests. And it, it concerns me because I see this administration moving away from that concept of what, where our, our real national interests lie in terms of our global engagement. It's very clear, unless you're in denial, that the current administration is withdrawing U.S. Uh, is retreating from the world stage, is disengaging on a whole vast range of issues that matter to the American people and to us as a nation. So, and, and that's reflected in USAID's new mission statement. And it's not just the, U, the U.S. The if new you mission look, statement. The new mission statement, yeah. right. It, it, it's also, if you look at DFID's mission statement, it also said the role of DFID is to promote uh, UK businesses and, uh, and um, uh, yeah, UK businesses abroad. So it's, it's, it's a movement that I see amongst uh, bilateral um, aid agencies that is very concerning because I think it misses where the national interest is. That on disability inclusion, yeah, I was hoping you were going to cover that's that. That's a big, it, for us at FHI 360, uh, um, that's a big issue for us, and we have uh, we have built into our to our entire uh, program development cycle from from design to um, competing for awards to implementing awards a social inclusion aspect. We very consciously put it put it in there that prominently includes. Disabil addressing disability. So if we're working in an IDP camp, for example, we want to we want to very intentionally understand what are the challenges that disabled people in this IDP camp face, and how are the programs that we're implementing addressing those. And I I think that we'll see um, that movement or that concern that that uh, awareness or consciousness continue to grow. Um, certainly, it's a big deal in my organization. And Can then I just, finally, let me just jump just jump in on the issue of, of the handi and the handicap issue. I think, I think as we move up the curve, as you have societies get wealthier, they can afford to spend more on issues like the environment, but also and invest in issues of being even more inclusive. And it's very it's it's very important. We're not. Uh, it's very important. It's in a very important concept. And so I think it's in terms of participating in the electoral process or participating in education or participating in the economy. These are all important parts of, of having a just society and a modern society. And in many ways, you're leaving, by leaving behind these folks, you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table for your society. Exactly, well said. Uh, yeah. Finally, just on your point, um, Again, from our perspective, you have to have comprehensive integrated approaches, and that means bringing different types of expertise, different kinds of backgrounds, like as I was saying, business or technical um, and other backgrounds, and combining them. And it's some, in some cases, you can find that in the same person. And in other cases, you've got to put together teams mm. that bring those different qualities together. But um, you know, we have 360 in our name, because we say we're ta we take a 360 degree approach to understanding and trying to solve human development challenges. Okay, Larry. I think the, the joint training okay, okay. issue is really important and really hard. I, I've been in charge of two or three of those now, and, and I say that it hasn't turned me any, any more sour on it than before, but it's made me a lot more realistic about it. Usually, for one thing, there's no symmetry in the scale between the development actors and the, and the defense folks. Mm -hmm. Development will show up with three or four people and defense will have 200 yeah. in the room. And, and <laughs> to try and also, sure. it's often an I'm from Mars, you're from Venus kind of a situation. So I think it's important enough that it should get a lot more attention. But it's not easy. The people aren't necessarily located in the same place. They've got the COCOMs. We don't have anything that exactly corresponds to the COCOMs. And so the, the dynamics of making it happen at a practical level, I think, have not been very well attended to. So I would give it a, a high score in importance, but a challenging score on, on feasibility. Well, the, okay, Larry. The, uh, on, the, on the issue of, of trade and US, US businesses, I think this is going to be a really 
uh, I wouldn't want to predict how this is going to go because uh, the, I think the US AID, if it becomes a kind of a quasi Department of Commerce, as for example, the, the Chinese aid program is run out of their equivalent of the Department of Commerce, the, that would be a sad day in terms of the way US has defined national interests. I'm with, <coughs> with Patrick on, on this issue. But there's a middle ground that I think is very feasible. I was uh, last week in Kosovo, and there was an issue in looking at the energy strategy for USAID in Kosovo that an American company is, has just signed for, on for a $1.3 billion investment in a power plant. Should that influence the strategy? Well, it did a little bit. It, it said through private sources, it, it, in the sense that AID felt, I think partially on philosophical grounds, but also partially in recognition of the fact that there was a large US investment pending that had been not, not promoted by USAID, but had been simply worked out through normal commercial channels. But, but, but Larry, if we'd rewind the tape 10, 20, or 30 years ago, I think it would have been fair to say it would still have influenced a little bit. If, I think that's true. Right? Is that yeah. a fair statement? I think that, that is a fair that's statement. That's a fair statement, okay. I think that is a fair statement, but I think there's a, a sensitivity that maybe, maybe at this moment is good, but could go over, over the yeah. line on this where people are more conscious of that as an aid officer in thinking about American commercial interests in that country and how they are potentially affected by aid policy and aid programs. I think we should be cognizant of it, but not go overboard. Yeah. That, that's, okay. that's, I'm agreeing with so, that. Okay, so. And, and just yeah, on, please. on disabilities, yes, I, wanted, I wanted to say, I think that Patrick's organization is a real exception on this. I, mm. What he said, I've actually seen them walk the talk on this, but I, I have to say, they're in a very distinct and regrettable minority. Uh, if you looked at the number of organizations, including the public agencies themselves, I think most are still at a tick the box stage on, on this issue. Okay, so we did a paper, let me just come back to this issue of, uh, I had a senior person in the administration come to me. I'm getting a, I'm getting a lot of door knocks uh, from serious people in the administration, so I want a couple say a couple things about the administration. There's a lot of serious, smart people in the administration trying to do the right thing. Uh, I think we have to operate as if that this is that uh, this is a we have to we got to play with the cards we've got and so I think one of the things is I think we need to listen and understand where they're coming from and I also think though that things like getting new information like seeing China as a threat has changed their position on issues and so there's you can have a conversation with the administration on a number of different issues if we go in and say you know I'm really worried about health system strengthening in Sierra Leone. <coughs> I think I'm going to get thrown out of a lot of offices. But if I say, do you want two more nurses to show up at Newark Airport with Ebola? They say, no, I don't want that. And I say, okay, well, let's have this conversation. Right? Some, some of it's about repackaging. Some of it's about understanding how we link it directly to specific self-interest. Like I said, if you said, I'm, I'm really worried about you know, getting SDG number seven in Guatemala, they're going to be like, oh, man, you know, get the hell out of here. But if you said, do you want 40,000 kids showing up at the, at the southern border? They say, no, I don't want that. How do I fix that? So that's great. Let's talk about SDG number seven, right? So it's a little bit of about packaging and understanding this. So I think this has always been about enlightened self-interest. And I think it's a little bit understanding our audience. And I think we do have a receptive audience. We can have, a, on many issues, we can have a conversation. And I think part of our job is to work with and support those folks who are, who are trying to do the right thing. The other thing is, thank you, thankfully, to organizations like the U.S. Global Leadership Campaign, we have, um, we have a very broad support in the U.S. Congress for the 150 account, which is the fancy term for the soft power budget in the United States. And so if someone puts forward a budget that's not very thoughtful or hasn't been thought through, there's often a, a let's call it a dialogue, or we could maybe say it's being pushed back in terms of saying, no, we don't agree with that. Now, I think... Some of it is to make sure that we, we do things in a way that, um, that we don't just keep, one of the things I don't want us to do is, is, is to have the Congress, even though they're supportive, continue to do the same thing that we've been doing for the last 20 years. We need to be able to adapt, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation. So let me go back to the question I asked each of you earlier. So if we were on in front of a congressional committee and they said, how do we prepare for the, what, what's the one thing we need to be doing? to prepare for the workforce of the future, what's that one thing we need to be doing? So I'll start with you, Aaron, and we'll just go down. Resource sufficient strategic workforce planning so that okay. we can recruit and retain the talent that we need to be relevant. Okay, Patrick? Patrick, I'm on the edge of my seat. My <laughs> <laughs> um, You're killing me with the suspense. We need people who have, uh, we need, wh what I would say is, Train your contracting officers to 
to understand the rules and to be able to do, um, to be effective problem solvers and use the partners you have in effective ways. Because right now what we see is that um, there is uh, a, a big deficit in what the agency wants to do and what it wants its partners to help it do and its ability to then manage the processes to make that happen. And a lot of that comes down um, in the, at the, on the contracting officer. Okay. Larry? I, of course, agree with both of those. I want to sort of, uh, I think, double down on, on Aaron's on this because there's now, I haven't seen this in a while, but there seems to be a lot of interest now in looking at the AID complement in whether it's on the organizational side mm -hmm. or on the personnel side. But to me, it hasn't squared the circle yet with what we want these people to do. Uh, the question you opened with, Dan, and, and that we've all talked around for the, for the last little while. I think we'll miss a chance if we don't use the, the willingness to rethink structure and personnel to catch up with the notion of what aid is supposed to be going forward. And I'm afraid we'll just opt for some things that are efficiencies or that, mm. or that tidy up the system a little bit, but that don't in any way square with the conversation we're having today, which is much larger about what we want the people of the future to be. If we miss it this window, I think it'll be a good long time before we see it again, because frankly, I don't really think there, this is a, a provocative statement, and particularly to make at the end of a session, but I think we won't have a thing 10 or 15 years from now that we call the international development community. I don't think so. I think there'll be a lot of people working on the same problem sets, but it won't, it won't Feel coalesce like this. that way. It's going to coalesce a different way. So, so, so right now, I think the, there's a particular opportunity, ironically provo uh, provoked by a certain yes. amount of adversity, yep. to, to really take hold of this and rethink where the agency is going and to try to make sure we've got the personnel to support okay. that. Please join me in thanking the panel.